Hello and welcome back to the Solo Practice University Appellate Practice and Procedure course. We are uh, on class number six, oral argument and the decision. So going right to the slides, uh, we have an introductory slide and this will just summarize briefly what it is we're going to cover today. Uh, we've just got through talking about the briefing stage of a case and now you're, you're past that and you're to the point where the, the case is fully briefed and you've received notice that oral argument is going to be held. So once you get that notice, what do you do? Uh, what are the next stages? How do you prepare? How do you present oral argument in the uh, appellate court, whether it be an intermediate court of appeals as we have here in Texas or the highest court in your jurisdiction or a circuit court uh, in having federal jurisdiction over federal district uh, courts and so forth. Um, so this class will focus on the, uh, the nature and purposes of oral argument, um, how to prepare for oral argument, some do's and don'ts uh, during argument, and then what to do after argument, including when you get the decision from the appellate court. So without further ado, let's just jump right in to the nature of oral argument, the next slide. Uh, oral argument is basically an intelligent dialogue between the justices on the bench of the appellate court and the advocates for the parties. Uh, there's usually 15 to 30 minutes or so set aside uh, per side to argue their respective cases. That varies greatly by court and jurisdiction and even within jurisdictions. Uh, some you know, would have local rules, for example, on how long uh, a party is allowed to argue and pretty often uh, what you get is a, a letter from the appellate court confirming that you're going to get oral argument, the date that it's going to take place, and some of the details that you can expect, uh, such as the, uh, the amount of time to be argued and how to handle rebuttal, which is something that I address in the next bullet point. Um, the appellant usually gets to carve out some, some of its time, uh, usually about five, up to about five minutes to rebut the argument made uh, by the appellee uh, at oral argument. Um, in terms of the nature, again, of oral argument, it is a, in this day and age, a fairly rare occurrence. Um, as we've discussed in the last two lectures on briefing, most cases are decided on the briefs. And so it is actually uh, important and, and a privilege uh, if you get notify that your case has been selected for oral argument, that generally means that the court has taken some kind of special interest in your case or has unanswered questions that it would like to address before attempting to issue a decision. So the one way I, I think I would recommend advocates look at oral argument is as an opportunity to assist the court in resolving the case in a manner that's favorable to your client um, with an emphasis on assisting the court in doing its job. Uh, there, there's a, a pretty good movement in Texas appellate practice toward uh, court-centered appellate advocacy, which uh, a, a, an appellate lawyer in Houston named Randy Roach is really kind of spearheading this, has done a lot of research in this area. And the more I think about it, the more I agree with what he says, that essentially, you know, you want to be an advocate and you want to guide the court to the result that, that benefits your client. But really, when you reach this stage of a case, the most effective way of advocating is to help the court understand what can be very, very difficult issues, um, very, very intricate fact scenarios, and um, put it all together and come out with a result that, that yes, is favorable to your client, but is also um, something that would be expected, uh, not, not a, you know, a completely random result, obviously, and something that's consistent with the jurisprudence of, of the jurisdiction. Okay, the next slide. Um, what are the purposes of oral argument? Well, you know, we'd like to think that the purpose would be for you to stand up and show what a stellar advocate you are uh, for your, your client, if your client's in attendance at the argument in particular, or for you to really impress uh, justices or others who may be in the gallery watching the argument. Well, that would be incorrect. Uh, there, are, there are three main reasons why oral argument is granted from the justice's perspective, and they are um, really you know, to answer their questions about three things. 
uh, questions about the record that they may have, uh, questions about the law that they may have and need the party's input on in a way that isn't not that the briefs are inadequate, but just that they're, you know, it's difficult to cover every aspect of every case in a brief, even if, if the brief is really well done. And sometimes the justices will have uh, questions even after reading what are, are very good briefs. And then finally, the justices may have questions about the policy implications of deciding the case uh, in a manner, uh, one, one way or the other. How is your case, the result that you're asking for in your case, going to affect future litigants, which in our justice system, uh, and with stare decisis being uh, a pinnacle of, of that system, this is really important. And the, court, the judges and the courts obviously have to consider what the long-term effects of their decisions are going to be in, in the larger picture of, of the law. So uh, from the party's perspective, um, you know, the purposes are, as always, to uh, try and steer the court to the result that you would like them to reach. Uh, to do that, you want to frame the issues at oral argument, uh, much like you do in briefs, in, in as favorable a way as you can, and yet still within the bounds of the, the record and the law. Um, from the appellant side, it seems sort of obvious, but you know you want to persuade the court of appeals that the judgment that you're attacking satisfied. Uh, what are most often really high standards for obtaining reversal, uh, harmful error, and those sorts of things that we've talked about in, in past lectures. So that's that's your back over the prior briefing in the case and the record. Uh, your obligation and your burden uh, within the bounds of ethics and zealous advocacy. And for the appellee, again, it seems sort of obvious, but I'll go ahead and just lay it out. You want to identify and emphasize the reasons why the judgment should be left alone and the court should let things lie and uh, move on to the next case after writing a, an opinion that affirms the decision of the lower court. Preparation for oral argument. How do you prepare? Well, there, you know, everybody has their own style and you, if you're just starting out as an appellate lawyer over time, will develop your own style. Uh, I can tell you I, I can give you an outline for more or less what I do, which I think is a process that's relatively common among appellate counsel uh, generally. And you might emphasize different phases of, of this preparation. Uh, the first is, it seems natural, to go back over the prior briefing in the case and the record. Um, you need to know, you know, what all the arguments are, the nuances of the arguments. Uh, you need to know what the factual uh, support is for the arguments that you've made. And you need to be able to, to defend those uh, in argument. And we'll come to um, how to do that a little bit later in terms of receiving questions from the bench and so forth. Um, aside from the briefs and the record, probably the next most important phase uh, that you can go through is to study the key cases that you've already cited in your briefs or that the other side has cited in theirs. Uh, and you want to take a particularly close look at or even look for patterns with cases that involve the same issue that you're asking or, or issues that you're asking the Court of Appeals to decide or even that involve the same judges. Um, it is, you, know, you can discern Possible, possibly you can discern patterns among the lines of decisions, among the you know, panels of justices, if they sit in panels uh, in your jurisdiction. They generally do, panels of three for the most part. It depends on, in part on the side, size of the court. Uh, some courts will sit en banc with every, every justice sitting all the time. Uh, again, it just varies according to jurisdiction. But if it would be useful and helpful to know the way that the judges who are sitting on your case have decided similar issues in the past. And so if you have not gone back and looked at that, looked at your cases and looked at the research you've done from that perspective, then I think uh, this would be the right time to do it. Um, and it, it can be a very useful tool, uh, particularly with respect to anticipating questions that your, uh, your panel might ask. If you've got a judge who wrote an opinion 
uh, in a premises liability case and or actually maybe even more importantly wrote a concurrence or a dissent and really picked up on a certain issue that, that the judge said uh, was unsettling the law or was not satisfied in that particular case uh, you might look for the similarities or even the differences uh, between that case that the judge had written about before and your case because these folks know what they've written about uh, and it's a good idea for you to know it because it's likely to inform the questions that they ask at oral argument. Aside from the cases that you've already cited uh, or the other side has cited in briefs, uh, it would be critical I think to as a next phase to update your, your research. So take a look if you've got access to uh, you know, Keysight or Shepherds or one of the services that tells you the subsequent history of cases and, and tells you, you know, you can research by head note, for example, in the West system. Um, go back and look at, at the key cases, shepherdize them, uh, see if there have been any new cases and new decisions issued out of your jurisdiction, particularly out of the court that you're going to be in front of. Uh, and just know those because you'll, <laughs> you'll feel foolish if the other side is aware of them and you're not and the other side is able to discuss them and how, and how they impact your case uh, if you're not prepared to do the same. And this can be actually a, a really good um, building block for sort of constructing the foundation of your argument. If you have a brand new case in your, uh, in your subject matter, in your jurisdiction, uh, or even from another court in your jurisdiction, uh, another appellate court, you can really structure an argument if, it, if that result benefits your client significantly, um, you can structure your argument around it or at least make one of your, um, one of your points that you intend to bring up an argument, uh, the impact of that case and demonstrate either why the case is similar to yours if, you, if that favors your client or just being able to distinguish it if it does not. Um, probably the next phase, and again, people vary this process significantly according to their individual styles, but probably the next phase uh, to go through is to outline your presentation. You've looked at the briefs, you've looked at the law, you've updated your research, you know you have probably on average 20 minutes to present your case, and you also should be um, aware that you're going to get questions from the justices. So there's a, a rule of thumb that I've heard that says you can prepare remarks but don't prepare them in such a way that they would last longer than about 75% of the allotted time that you have if you really need to get through all of what you have to say because you're going to get enough, unless you've got what we would call just a really, really cold panel that doesn't ask any questions. And in my experience, that's rare these days because if a, if a court has gone to the trouble of granting oral argument, it generally has questions and it's not going to use up precious argument time uh, for a case that doesn't require uh, that kind of thought and, and input. So the point I'm making is start out by outlining the argument as you would like to make it and uh, pick the points that you would you think are really important. Again it's like briefing. You can't you can't argue everything especially in a very limited amount of time that you have at, at oral argument. But um, you know, include what you would like to include, and you can always whittle it down from there uh, in an outline. Um, moving to the next slide, some people find scripting, you know, actually scripting out an introduction, scripting out a conclusion, scripting out portions of, of argument, scripting out answers to anticipated questions uh, to be very useful. I don't do a lot of that. I like to I have sort of an extemporaneous style and I don't want things to sound too stilted or memorized so I generally mostly focus on the concept that I want to get across and how do I explain that in, um, in terms that are you know, easy to understand which is something that you want to go for. Um, but I, I do like to try and understand how all the pieces of the, of the puzzle fit together and you know, how argument A fits with argument C2 and you know, where all, what the different theories are, what the different arguments are. And so for that reason, I really like to use flowcharts to kind of give me a snapshot 
of the case, and I usually just list the issues and how you know, draw arrows and uh, circles and all kinds of things that you can you can really get creative on if you want to. But for me, that's really a way of of synthesizing, you know, boiling the case down. It's kind of like in law school; you know, they tell you um, start out by outlining, you know, and whittle your outline down to just a few bullet points. It's the same basic process. You want to get a command of the information, uh, but it's useful in, in preparation to uh, whittle it down to smaller, you know, shorter and shorter outlines, even though your knowledge shows a, a great deal more than what appears on a piece of paper. Uh, so as the next point suggests, and I think the one of the best things about argument is uh, and it forces you to do this, frankly, to distill your case down to its barest elements. Um, and that's the key reasons why you should win. Uh, that should be your goal in, in preparing for argument, even if you're starting out with a 50-page brief uh, or you know, probably over 100 pages of, of briefing total in a, in a significant case. You need to hone right in and pick those, those points that are just absolutely critical to the resolution of the case from your side uh, and from your opponent's side. And uh, another critical element, and I think people overlook this sometimes and because they're more concerned with what they're going to say and the presentation that they would like to make to the justices, but I think probably half your preparation time ought to be spent anticipating the questions that the justices might ask. Um, in writing out, if it's useful to you, scripting out or bullet pointing out answers to those questions because you know more or less what the weak points in your case are and in your opponent's case. And you're going to have an, an opportunity, you know, that the justices are going to ask questions, again, unless it's a completely dead panel, and I haven't seen that happen very often. Um, the justices are going to ask questions that interrupt the flow of your presentation and hone in on the issues that they want to talk about. And so it's important to anticipate what those questions might be and um, figure out ways, even if you get asked questions to throw you off base, to flow back into uh, an argument that's uh, logical and sequential and, and makes sense. And the way you do that, finally, is in part through practice. Um, there are many, many ways of practicing and preparing for an oral argument. You can do a full-blown moot court if you have uh, partners or associates or fellow solo lawyers uh, in your, either in your firm or in the community who can help you with that. Uh, that Non-lawyers can be useful because, as we've all heard at various times, you know, the, the way to communicate effectively in preparing briefs and, and making oral argument is to speak at you know, an eighth or ninth grade level and make sure that, that you're understood. And if you are not understood, then you need to keep working because, you know, sometimes these judges don't have uh, a, a great deal of experience in, the, in a particular subject matter that you're presenting uh, on appeal. And you need to be sure that you can speak about it intelligently, but yet uh, simply, which is an ongoing challenge in, in appellate practice. So do a moot court if you can. Um, if you can't do a moot court, you can practice uh, by yourself, which you know, a lot of solos will be in the position of, of doing um, just because you know, they, the availability of someone to listen may not be there the same as it is in a firm. And that's not necessarily a, a, a poorer way of preparing. Um, you can record yourself, you can use a video camera, you can uh, just stand at a podium and practice your intros go through your transitions, go through the key areas of your argument that you want to make sure you, you get and you feel comfortable with the verbiage that you want to use. Uh, again, you know, without necessarily memorizing a script or having what uh, the judges would consider to be a canned answer to a question. You want to be sure an answer, we'll get into this later, but you want to be sure and answer the question as it's asked. So <clears throat> practice, preparation, uh, these are these are key key elements. Um, I hear a tale of lawyers spending uh, many many days, if not arguments in the, in, for example, at Texas Supreme Court, uh, two weeks preparing for argument. I've I've never felt like I had that kind of luxury of time. Uh, so 
And then there are, there's also the issue of whether your client can afford it, <laughs> uh, which you have to, you know, as always in, in solo and small firm practice, you have to strike a balance between the resources that your client has and, uh, and what you're able to do for them, uh, not compromising the quality of your representation, which is an extremely difficult balancing act, as, as I believe we've discussed before. So uh, <clears throat> practice makes perfect preparation uh, and, and practice will make for an effective presentation as far as preparing for it substantively. So then the question becomes, well, I've got the substance prepared. I know, you know, basically my case. What do I do or what do I not do? You know, what are some do's or don'ts for oral argument? And so we'll move on to the next slide, which starts the oral argument do's. If you have never visited this particular court that you're going to be in front of before, take some time and go, unless you're having to travel from far away. Uh, if it's in your town, for example, there's no excuse not to take some time and you visit the courtroom, preferably when the court is actually holding arguments so you can get a really a real good sense of the mechanics of how the court is run, uh, how the bailiff operates things, the, uh, the lighting system is important uh, and just general setup. So become familiar, talk to another, another idea if you can't travel to that locale, another idea would be to talk to attorneys uh, who have actually presented arguments in that court and they can give you some sense of, uh, of what to expect. Um, I didn't list it as a separate item here on the slide, but a related concept is to, if you're if you find out who your panel is, and, and this, this is going to vary widely according to, to the court you're in, um, some courts will tell you up front in your, in your notice letter uh, who's going to be on your panel. And uh, some circuit courts, you know, like in the Fifth Circuit here, you, you'll get notice that your argument's going to take place the week of you know, October 4th. Um, and they'll, they'll tell you later who's going to be on your panel and exactly when your argument is. That's always fun. Uh, but in state court, at least, it seems, and this is probably true across jurisdictions, you're going to know in advance who your, who your panel is. So uh, do some homework on those judges and their particular leanings. And uh, this is sort of implied in some of the things that I, I said earlier about uh, pulling the opinions of the judges that are on your panel. But if it's not apparent... Um, you know what their particular judicial philosophy is, what their leanings are. Uh, do some homework on them. Uh, do some homework on what their practices are during argument. Do they tend to ask a lot of questions? Do they tend to um, give softball questions? You know, do they tend to ask really difficult questions that no one can answer? These are just all kinds of background things that you can do to help yourself be better prepared or as prepared as possible for oral argument. Um, we've talked about this <clears throat> a little bit already too, but a, a, another big do is uh, know the record, even if you weren't involved at the trial, and even if you didn't prepare the appellate briefs. There's no worse response to a question that, a, that a, an appellate justice may ask than, I don't know, Your Honor, I didn't prepare the brief in this case. <laughs> that is not going to cut it. Uh, you're instantly going to lose credibility with the court and the court is going to um, find things that you say from that point on somewhat suspect because it becomes apparent that you didn't put in enough time uh, reviewing the record, reviewing the law to pre adequately prepare yourself to help the court decide the case. So it, it's, uh, it can be a lot of work and maybe you're able to utilize uh, some summaries that have been pre prepared in advance in, in longer records that is something that if you can develop a system for uh, digesting the records that's that's useful uh, in solo practice it's not always practical uh, I'll tell you one thing that I do just as a little trick uh, if maybe you haven't thought of up until this point is when I get the record I, I scan it put it in PDF form and um, I make it OCR so I can do word searches in it, which is great for when you're looking for certain things, preparing briefs. 
But I also use that in preparing for oral argument because, you know, you can, if you have it scanned and indexed and you have a, a widescreen uh, computer screen or you, you have it in paper form, which I would also recommend, it becomes easier to hone in on certain points in the record that you need. For example, if you need to answer a burning question about, you know, what the summary judgment evidence was on such and such point, it makes it a lot easier to locate that information if you have it available to run word searches or if you have it indexed electronically um, <clears throat> and of course a paper copy as well. But I have found that to be a, a tool that has been extremely useful to me not only in, in preparing briefs but also in getting ready for argument and even for dealing with cases after a decision comes down. So. Um, if you're a sole practitioner or a small firm practitioner doing appellate work, I hope that you've already taken advantage of some of the things that are available to you technologically nowadays. But if you haven't, I want to suggest that you uh, follow up on that and consider implementing some of those steps that I just described. <clears throat> uh, another major oral argument due is to, as we talked about a little earlier, to know the law on both sides of the case. Don't just know the cases that are favorable to your position. You need to be able to discuss and distinguish cases that cut against you. And this is something that the judges in argument will test you on. You can expect to, especially if your briefs, for whatever reason, didn't adequately deal with these kinds of issues, you can expect to be grilled on the kinds of responses that the court wants to know about with respect to um, decisions that, that could be adverse to your position. So <clears throat> you got to spend the time studying the law, studying the case law. If you're in a narrow procedural area, um, this is really not that difficult. You know, the, it, it depends a little on view you as not being prepared. And that is to approach the podium with as few materials, <clears throat> excuse me, as few materials as you can take up there as possible. Uh, this, this dovetails into your preparation. What I do is I go to the podium with generally how many appellate courts are in your jurisdiction, how they treat each other's cases, the, the weight of authority that they provide uh, and they, they afford each other. But in, for example, in summary judgment, you most often are going to have uh, a good number of authorities coming out of the, the high court of your jurisdiction. And so, you know, there really isn't it really is going to come down to an application of those standards to, to what's been presented in your case more often than not. And the standard review is generally going to be de novo. And so you're going to be arguing to the court, here's what I've got, here's what the law is, and here's what the outcome should be. Uh, but if you've got a case, you know, if there's some nuance in your case, such as a, a defective affidavit or something like that, you do need to know what the cases say that have dealt with those issues in the past in your jurisdiction and why it is that your case, um, the court can still get to the result that you are asking it to get to uh, despite those cases. The next slide of oral argument dues, um, this is something that I, I highly recommend because it's very disruptive to, to have another practice and the judges will view you as not being prepared. And that is to approach the podium with as few materials, <clears throat> excuse me, as few materials as you can take up there as possible. Uh, this, this dovetails into your preparation. What I do is I go to the podium with generally no more than a, than a one inch binder with me. Um, I'll have my short outline and, and a lot of times what I'll do, a little trick I've developed over time, is I will have it where I open it and what I, the materials that I want to see to jog my memory and so forth are on um, both sides of a page. So that if, if I open it and it lays flat, I have information on the left side that's on the back side of whatever that page is and information on the right side, which is on the front side of the next page. So that I have basically two, two eight and a half by 11 sheets worth of information, whether it be a flow chart, which again, I recommend uh, or a, a traditional outline or an excerpt from a case or something like that. Uh, generally, I'll, I'll take a binder like that with those materials and 
I'll use it as a as a preparation notebook. I'll put also the um, the key cases. Usually, it's only four or five cases that are really key in your case. In in my experience, I'll put those in there highlighted just so if you know if a court asks me about a new decision on this subject matter, then most of the time I'm going to have it in my notebook because I'm going to have prepared and, and, and seen that that's likely to be important. And I'm going to highlight the key language in that case, and I'm going to mark that case up as it appears in my notebook with my observations. And I'm going to be able to refer to it if, if Justice so-and-so you know, asked me a point or a question about that case and why it's distinguishable. I'm, if I need to, if I don't know it automatically, then I can refer to it in my notebook and, and go to the highlighted portions and jog my memory. So that is about the, the maximum amount of stuff that you ought to take to the podium. Um, you see people, you know, haul books up there. You see people haul sometimes, you know, volumes of the record. That's really not, you, you need to have a good enough command of the record when you go into argument that you're not taking it with you. Unless I mean, if it's something that important, then you should have pulled it out and put it in your notebook and be able to flip through it and refer to justices to the volume and page number, which can be a very um, and very impressive technique to, to be able to do that. Um, it, it's difficult, but you know, if you review and prepare adequately, you will you will master the record to the point where you know you'll be able to refer to certain specific facts, but. I, you know, referring to, to page and line in a, in a, in a trial testimony, uh, that can be impressive. I'm not sure that it's expected uh, among judges. I think that's, uh, there, there's over-preparation, uh, you know, there's under-preparation, over-preparation, and being, memorizing the record is probably over-preparation, but having key portions in your notebook for easy reference, uh, I think is, is a reasonable way of approaching that sort of thing. Um, so we've approached the podium. Now you want to make sure that you communicate with the judges. And to do that, you want to use what we think of, uh, if you've taken a trial advocacy class or an appellate advocacy class or a speech class in undergrad, or if you're in Toastmasters or Rotary or any, any type of club like that that encourages you to, to uh, communicate effectively using you know, sort of tried and true techniques, uh, then, then make, make sure you do that. And that, that includes things like eye contact. When a justice asks you a question, you wanna make eye contact with that justice and show that you're paying attention. And not only that, but it's just a good idea generally. Don't, you know, we're gonna to get to this in the don'ts, but you don't wanna show up and, and just be reading the, a prepared presentation. Uh, you wanna have as much eye contact with the judges and you want, as you can, you want to maintain a proper tone of voice. You want to have a proper inflection. If you have a certain point you're trying to make, you want to be able to, to use uh, a varied tone of voice to do that. You want to have appropriate posture at the podium, which means you know, standing up reasonably straight. Uh, don't lean over the podium. Don't slouch. I'm getting into don'ts more than do's now, but you, you get the point. Um, the, the point is, as a do, is you know, in addition to practicing the substance of your argument, it's important to, to recognize the strategies for effectively communicating with the justices. And the, the primary one is speaking clearly and appropriately uh, in a respectful tone, um, but yet, you know, loud enough to be able to, to be understood and maintaining as much eye contact as you can. Uh, again, my approach is I, I try to be as conversational as I can be and so I think eye contact is one of the critical elements for me in my style of oral argument, is to make that connection with the justices. So um, if you are taking this course, more than likely you took an appellate advocacy uh, course or, had, or were involved in some kind of uh, moot court program in your law school. I believe in the first year programs generally still teach, as part of the legal research and writing, uh, classes still teach or still have a moot court uh, as part of the, the usually the second semester as I recall uh, program and so you are probably told to go to the podium and say may it please the court uh, and I'll do it with eye contact this time may it please the court uh, that is a 
it seems sort of archaic, but that is a tried and true uh, method of getting things started in the courts. Um, the courts know what, what's coming. If you say that, they know that you're ready. Um, it, you should have eye contact when you say it. And then at that point, you've got the justice's attention and they will, they will be expecting you to proceed with your argument. Uh, if you have not been introduced by the bailiff or the, or the clerk, uh, go ahead and just briefly remind the court who you are and who you represent. Sometimes that's not necessary. If, you're, if you've been doing this long enough, um, the court, you, know, you would expect the court to be reasonably well prepared, have read your briefs and understand who you represent. And if you happen to know the justices, this is more true even still. Um, I generally, even if I am familiar with the court, will just briefly, unless the bailiff has introduced me, I'll just say, you know, may it please the court, I'm Todd Smith and I represent the appellant so-and-so. And then jump into the argument. And you just want to remind the court who you are for a number of reasons, but um, not the least of which is, you know, if you're going to practice uh, appellate law and you want the judges to get to know you and so presenting an effective argument and then connecting your name to an effective argument can be a really big benefit. So the next slide of dues, um, once you've addressed the court, may it please the court, um, and if you've needed to introduce yourself or remind the court who you are, then use the first minute or so, minute to minute and a half, to frame the issues as you've elected to frame them and summarize for the court where it is that you intend to go during your argument time. Um, as I say, and we'll, we'll get into questions again in, in, in a minute, but um, that first minute is probably the only time you're going to have, and you may not even get that, to make an uninterrupted presentation to the justices. Um, fairly often, you know, the courts are well enough prepared that they know some questions to ask and will jump in right away before you even finish going through telling the court what it is you're going to say. And so um, if you can get out of the gate by telling the court, you know, I want to advance three reasons why, in argument today, why the judgment should be reversed, um, and then here are the three reasons, then that is a good way of, of uh, sort of segueing into your presentation. And then, you know, if you, if you identify the three reasons and one of the judges has a particular interest in, in one of those, you can reasonably expect you're going to get taken off your outline and you're going to go down that road and you're going to want to be able to loop back to the overall um, outline. But the thing to remember, if I get no other point across in this lecture today, the thing to remember is answering the judge's questions is the most important thing to do. And so you need to let the judges take you off your outline uh, and, and address their questions and then come back to the outline as time permits. Um, we talked about the standard review a lot in, uh, in the briefing lectures. It is just as important in oral argument as it is uh, in, in briefing because if, if the standard is the least bit unclear or if it's unclear how it applies, that can really influence how the court analyzes the case and how the court resolves the case. And so make sure that you weave into your argument uh, the standard review and how it applies. Most of the time, uh, you know, this doesn't always happen, but in, in my experience, judges are, are prepared, they've read the briefs, they're familiar with your case, and so most of the time it's not necessary to start your argument with a long recitation of the facts in the procedural history of the case. There are some exceptions to that, such as if a fact, there is a fact issue that is critical to the resolution of the issues, uh, or if the procedural history is somehow significant to the outcome uh, in a way that just goes beyond the, what the law is and how the law ought to apply to your case. Uh, but if you have to, if you feel compelled to discuss the facts of the case, other than to say this is a premises liability case, Jury said, you know, jury came back with a finding of liability, the court signed a judgment, here are the legal issues, boom, boom, boom. Uh, then try to keep it brief, stick to those that are, that are necessary to the issues that you intend to raise. Don't go, uh, don't go down the rabbit trail. Uh, 
for fear of wasting time and argument, which you don't have enough of generally uh, to begin with. So uh, just be cautious about going into too much detail on facts. Um, the final point on this slide of dues is, again, that the, the most critical uh, part of oral argument, and that is answering the justice's questions. Um, do it directly. Uh, again, eye contact. Don't evade the question. Uh, deal with deal with the question that you're that you receive as in as upfront and as forthright a manner as possible. Even if it's a difficult question, and even if it is one that the answer doesn't necessarily favor your client. Um, by doing that, by, rather than trying to evade or be cute, you will maintain your credibility with the justices. They'll listen to the rest of your argument rather than tune you out because they think that you're not being uh, forthright enough for them. So, you know, there's no better piece of advice for oral argument than answer the justices' questions as succinctly, honestly, forthrightly, accurately as you can. Um, the next slide, similar point. You may get asked by a justice to make concessions. Well, counsel, isn't it true that you know your opponent proved up this point by this other witness over here, and therefore you get the idea. Um, if it's true, uh, then you know most likely you need to, to fess up to it and just say, "Well, yes, your honor, but let me let me give you three reasons why the outcome doesn't change because of that fact." You know, take take the, the judges, take the court back to the reasons why you win, uh, even if you've got difficult, you know, sort of warts in your case that you really can't get around. Uh, don't, don't try to get around them unless you come up with um, a way of distinguishing the facts or legal issues involved in, in, in that confrontation from your case. If it's a fact that you can concede and, and still win, by all means, just concede it. There's no point in, in belaboring it or tangling with the judge about something that by asking the question, they probably already know the answer. And so, and this again helps your credibility. So it, it's a good idea to know in advance even um, what kind of concessions that you, you should be prepared to make uh, because you're probably gonna be asked to, to make at least one in an oral argument. Um, as you come to the end, uh, if you have time, uh, generally <laughs> the different courts have different lighting systems, but a good, a good rule of thumb is if you have green, yellow, and red, yellow meaning you know two minutes or something like that, and red meaning you're out, at, out of time. When the yellow light comes on, it's probably time to start summarizing. So if, if time permits you to do that, then just give a brief summary of your points. You don't need to repeat everything, but just remind the court of, of what you've talked about and why you win. And then at the end, you want to go ahead and give a request for relief, if time permits, and just you know, reminding the court the outcome that you're asking for. Uh, sometimes you know you're at the end of a question, and the light goes off, and the court has really engaged you in questioning, and you haven't been able to reach all your points. And um, if the red light goes off, probably a good it's a good idea to ask if you can complete your answer, uh, or you can just say, uh, you know. I see my time is up. Unless the court has further questions, uh, I'll have a seat. Or you know, it's probably something a little more eloquent than that. Um, but the the lesson really in this is don't try to go over your time. The court won't appreciate it. Uh, I have seen lawyers get scolded from the bench. Counsel, I see your time is up. Uh, we'd like to hear from the appellee. You know that kind of tone. So you don't want to be the one that that happens to. Uh, effective appellate advocates know. The timing system that the court has, know how to work with it, and know how, when when the lights change, know what they need to be doing. If it's, again, yellow, you need to be trying to start wrapping it up. If it's red, even if you have to just say, I see my time is up, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, that's, that's the correct thing to do. Um, I'm not really going to spend any time on how to deal with rebuttal argument uh, other than you know, a rebuttal is not, if you're, the, if you're the appellant and you've set aside five minutes for rebuttal, it's not really the time to re-argue points that you've already made. 
Uh, really, I think an effective use of rebuttal is to literally rebut the points that the appellee has made. Um, what I do is, and what a lot of people do, is I'll take a legal pad and I'll draw a line down the middle of it. Uh, and I'll take notes on the left-hand side of what, what the other side is arguing, what the appellee is arguing. Or the, or the appellant, if I'm representing the appellee, and I want to hit, you know, in addition to points that I've prepared in advance, uh, I want to hit points and respond to points that they've made directly, which is generally a good idea, by the way. Um, you need to be prepared to some degree as, as an appellee to respond to the, the appellant's argument. But going back to rebuttal, I'll take notes about what the other side has said, and then the points that I think really need to be covered in rebuttal, I'll draw an arrow over to the right-hand column and on the, the legal pad that I've, I've created these columns and made a note, you know, remind myself of what the point, what the response is, and then I'll, I'll take that one sheet. I, I might take my notebook, but I'll add that one sheet, uh, that legal size sheet, or the, just the pad. It's probably a better practice so you're not tearing out pages uh, to what I take to the podium so that I know, you know, when I'm speaking during rebuttal, I have some items that I, I know I need to cover there, and that's a, a good reminder. You will, however, most often get enough questions in rebuttal that you will be struggling to get to the points that you wanted to make. Uh, rebuttal, in my experience, is the time when the judges really hone in on the questions that they have for you. And so uh, it's like everything else in oral arguments. You can prepare, and you need to prepare as much as you can, but don't expect that you're necessarily going to get to make a 20-minute speech because it's probably not going to happen. And rebuttal is the same. All right, let's move on to the don'ts. Oral argument don'ts. Things that you absolutely, well, most of these are absolute, but things that you shouldn't do in oral argument. I can tell you with un, just unlimited conviction that you should not stand up in oral argument and read your brief or a prepared script to the court. Um, not an appellate argument, but not too long ago, I was at a court hearing um, in which a really experienced lawyer stood up, and it, was, it wasn't an evidentiary hearing, it was, a, it was just a, a hearing, stood up and, I mean, just about literally read his brief, word for word, to the court. It took about 45 minutes in the court, was extremely patient with him. Uh, I would not have been that patient if I were the judge. I would say, you know, break it down for me, counsel. Um, but this judge had a reputation, has a reputation for letting people present their arguments, and that's exactly what he did. Um, the other side stood up and read their, their brief, and um, I couldn't really believe it just because of the the level of, of experience that this particular lawyer had. <clears throat> and it's nobody that anybody um, watching this video would know, more than likely. Um, it, it goes back to maintaining eye contact, having your outline, knowing your case, being prepared. Uh, and if you'll use those effective communication techniques, the, the problem of reading your brief or reading a script won't be an issue uh, because you'll know, you'll, you'll feel confident enough in the uh, preparation that you've made, that you'll, you'll be able to speak intelligently and conversationally with the court without relying on reading to the court, which is about as big of a no-no just about as you can get. There's probably some room for difference of opinion on the next point, but I say here don't use visual, visual aids if you can help it. Um, I tend to think that anything that you would put in the visual aid should have been in your brief, or should have been a chart in your brief, or should have been in the appendix to your brief, if the, your rules allow it. Um, if you want the court to, to listen to what you're saying, then don't give them something to look at that they've never seen before. Um, you know how it is in any meeting you go into. If there are handouts, what are people gonna be looking at during the meeting? They're gonna be looking at the handouts. Are they gonna be listening to the speaker? Probably not as likely. So. You know, I think there are people who, are, who use visual aids um, somewhat effectively in oral argument. I just don't do it, and I don't recommend that you do it. I think what you want to do is you want to you want to focus on your relationship with the judges on the bench, and it's it's a distraction 
to either have a, a chart, you know, a blow up chart or handouts for them to be looking at during the argument. This is a sort of conventional wisdom in uh, oral argument, but an appellate argument is not the time or place to make a jury argument. They are two different things. Uh, you, as an appellate advocate, you are uh, supposed to be dispassionate, accurate, uh, be able to explain the law uh, and how the law applies to the facts. You are not, it is not good for them to get up and explain the injustice, you know, argue about the injustice of this situation. This big company, you know, did your client wrong? Um, the kinds of things that you would see in a jury argument. And this is where, frankly, trial lawyers tend to, to get into trouble in appellate practice, is they sometimes will forget where they are. And they are fantastic advocates before the fact finder. Um, but this is a different approach completely. And this is one of the main things that distinguishes appellate practice from trial practice is you're dealing with a completely different audience than you are in a jury trial uh, and, and even to some degree in a bench trial uh, even though it's a judge deciding the, the case um, you want to you want to stick to the legal arguments and the facts and show the court why you win on those bases uh, applying relying on a lot of rhetoric uh, you know it's not fair you know those kinds of arguments in an oral argument uh, an appellate argument is not effective advocacy and the next point seems like common sense but don't interrupt if you when you get questions from the panel don't interrupt or talk over the justices uh, it's just bad form in general sometimes the justices will talk over each other and you're in a position of kind of let, having to let the dust settle a little bit uh, before you address one question or the other if you don't understand a question that's been asked because of that kind of uh, overlay of, of questioning, feel free to tell the court, uh, you know, Your Honor, I'm not sure I understand the question. Or if you would repeat the question, uh, I would appreciate it. And then that way you can sort of refocus the discussion on the question that one judge or the other has asked. Uh, and then it's, it's always perfectly fine to turn to another justice and ask if you've answered their question. Uh, I think a lot of times judges would appreciate you being concerned about addressing the questions that they had uh, if, if you think that maybe you haven't. So consider doing that as well if you're in a situation where the judges are talking over each other. Um, the next slide on don'ts, some of these are, they, some of these seem sort of obvious, but again, these are, you know, points worth making. Uh, don't go outside the record. Don't say, well, in the hallway during uh, jury deliberations, the lawyer for the opposing party told me that whatever. Okay, or if you want to allege another fact, if you want to rely on, on another fact uh, that's, that would otherwise support your position on appeal, if it's not in the record, it's, it's not fair game. It's off limits. And... Again, as, as most things in appellate practice, I've, I've mentioned this over and over in this course, um, you have to maintain, do whatever's necessary to maintain your credibility. And one way to lose it is to start arguing about things outside the record. The judges know, you know, everybody knows that that is something that should not be done. Um, one of the challenging things of appellate practice is that you're limited to the universe, you know, the four corners of that appellate record as to the facts that you can argue. And uh, so going outside is, uh, is, is really a negative thing. A related point, don't misrepresent the record and don't misrepresent the law. These again, these points again go to credibility and um, there's no faster way to lose your credibility than for the court to read a case closely after you tell it what the case means and it means something else entirely. Or um, for you to say, yes, you know, so-and-so's affidavit submitted in opposition to the motion for summary judgment clearly says whatever. Um, they're going to pull that. The judges are going to pull that and read it, and it's going to be clear to them if you have said something that is, is uh, not consistent with the representation, or if you've said something that is not consistent with what the record of the case actually says, uh, they're going to know. And that, that is, again, something that ultimately uh, could harm your client. And 
and future clients because the court is not going to be as likely to, to listen to you the next time you make that statement. Credibility is, is critical. Um, kind of like the idea of don't make a jury argument. Um, don't stray from behind the podium. Uh, there's, there are certain rules of decorum, even unwritten rules of decorum in appellate practice. Uh, this is one of them. The courts don't want you straying in front of counsel table, going up and down either side. Uh, even You may be one of those people that walks around when you're trying a case in front of a jury. That's not the way to do it in appeals. Um, stand behind the podium, put your hands at the front of the podium, or maybe just in front of you, um, you know, Try not to latch on and hold on for dear life. That's uh, something that a lot of people struggle with. But point, plant yourself behind the podium, behind that microphone, and usually in front of the lighting system. And you know, turn your head, turn your body slightly to, to address different justices, but don't walk around. It's, it's just bad form. Um, another sort of common sense thing that I'll mention anyway, because it, it's, you do see it from time to time, is uh, don't engage in theatrics when it's your opponent's turn to speak. <sighs> Rolling your eyes, you know, sighing, tapping your pencil, um, you know, whispering to your opposing counsel. That's that's a, that's wrong. You know, you, you get the picture. These are things that the court, certainly opposing counsel, won't appreciate, but the court won't appreciate because the court is there to make up its mind. Uh, about the facts and the law, and the, and the court is the at this point the judge of who to believe, and you can argue in in your time. Well, I, I have to differ with my opposing counsel about what he said on such and such point, you know, and explain why. But you know, sort of juvenile reactions, rolling the eyes, and, and you know, I'm doing it a few times here. Hopefully, gotten it across. Um, those kinds of reactions are inappropriate, no place in the, the appellate courtroom, and ultimately, you know, they will they will hurt you more than they help. All right, so we've moved on now to after the argument. You've you've uh, given your your conclusion. You've asked the court for relief, or explain otherwise what the court should do. Um, the court has said thank you very much. The case is submitted. Whatever the protocol it is for for your jurisdiction and then what do you do well if your client wasn't there and maybe even if they were uh, you should provide some kind of report to the client if the client is there you know spend some time out in the hallway or go back to your office uh, and talk to the client about the argument and how it went um, one of the main reasons to do that is what's illustrated in the next point <clears throat> and that is you know, to remember that the questions that you get during oral argument don't necessarily suggest to you which way that the judges are, are leaning. Um, you get a lot of devil's advocate questions. Uh, one sort of complexity of oral argument is you get, sometimes the judges will really be talking to each other rather than to you by the questions that they ask. And uh, so, you know, it, it may seem like a panel or a justice is leaning one particular direction but what they really might be doing is you know, trying to answer some difficult questions that they need answered before they write an opinion that goes your way. And so uh, don't, don't assume that they're being judgmental about your case when they ask these kinds of tough questions. Um, but probably uh, what you should do is remind the client or advise the client that that is the nature of oral argument and that it's, you cannot tell and, and it's it's inadvisable to try and predict the outcome of an appellate matter based on how the argument went. Uh, I've seen arguments that I thought went great, you know, didn't come out my way, and arguments that I thought were just okay, you know, come out with a fantastic result for my client. And I think anybody who does uh, appellate work will tell you that it just trying to predict the outcome based on the argument is a, is a really bad idea. It's like trying to predict the outcome um, based on the briefs even. Sometimes that, that's, that's a more likely predictor, uh, I would say, depending on you know, the issues. But argument itself is not a good predictor of how the case is going to turn out. 
because remember, the brief is really the more important uh, form of advocacy, even though we all love argument. And, and we, it's, it's challenging and it's, uh, frankly, it's the sexy part of appellate practice. Uh, and, and arguing in, a, in a, the highest appellate court in your jurisdiction can be one of the most satisfying things that you'll do in your career. Uh, but it is not a, a place to, to make predictions. And I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Um, after the argument, when the dust kind of settles a little bit, you might also want to consider whether to file a post-submission brief. Sometimes the justices will ask questions, um, and it'll be something that isn't addressed for whatever reason in the briefs. And um, you can say so. That's, I probably ought to hit this point before I go too far away from it and say, if you don't know the answer to a question that you get in oral argument, it's perfectly fine to say that I don't know. I don't know the answer. Um, and then it, this ties into the supplemental brief idea. Um, if it's an important, use your judgment, but if it's an important enough point, you might ask the court, and it may be something you know nobody's thought of before, but a, a judge uh, has brought up, and you, you may ask, uh, I don't know the answer to that, Your Honor, but I'd be, I'd be pleased to submit a supplemental uh, brief or a post-submission brief addressing that point. And sometimes the court will say, yes, we'd like you to do that. Uh, or sometimes they don't say anything at all, which is where ultimately where I'm going with this. If the court says, yes, please do it, uh, then by all means give the court what it wants. Uh, if you are stumped by a question, this is really where this comes up most often, um, if you're stumped by a question and don't know the answer and think it's important to follow up, then check your rules about post-submission briefing because a lot of times um, motions for leave would be required. Uh, and then prepare, sometimes it can be done by letter, uh, post-submission letter brief, just hitting the narrow point, the narrow issue. Sometimes you wind up writing a more significant brief and you bind it and file it just like you would any other brief. But don't just do it just because. Um, Post-submission briefs need to have a purpose and need, need, to be, need to deal with an issue that's important enough uh, for you to, you know, to justify you sitting down and writing something on that narrow topic. Uh, so consider you know, whether this is an issue, if it's not something the court has asked you to do, consider whether this is an issue that's important enough that it could affect the outcome of the case. Uh, and if it is, and you know, consider the benefits of, of filing a post-submission brief and again, consult your rules. What do you do then? Um, argument is over, you've consulted your client, uh, you've explained to the client you know, what, what to think about argument, what not to think about argument, uh, and then you wait. <laughs> um, that's something that's not really covered in the outline here in the, in the PowerPoint, but um, one thing to be mindful of in explaining you know, after argument what to expect is how long your court takes before it issues decisions. Um, there are so many variables to this, it's, it's almost impossible to predict, uh, and so that may be the answer that you need to give your client, because a lot of times the client will ask, how long is this gonna take? They, and they usually ask that at the beginning of an appeal, but where you, when you really hear it, I think even more often is after oral argument, or after the briefs are completed, is another, another area where you hear it. How long is this gonna take? Well, I think it would be unwise, just like it's unwise to predict the outcome of a case based on oral argument, I think it's unwise to try and, and pin down the time for, to a decision with any specificity because there are just too many variables. The, the court works uh, behind closed doors and you have no input as to the speed with which uh, these things happen. So I think you probably could give the client a range and say, well, based on the complexity of the case, we would expect it to take, you know, six to nine months, six months to a year, something like that. And that is, you know, you want to leave enough, frankly, wiggle room in there so that the client, when, when the result does come, it's within the client's expectations of what you told them. 
but uh, it, it is very difficult, again, to make predictions. And so I would study your court and take a look and see what the trends are in terms of how quickly we're deciding cases. This is a, a, a question that's going to vary widely uh, jurisdiction by jurisdiction and court by court. So I guess I would leave it as just use caution before you tell the client how long to, to expect to wait because, again, if you, if you get too specific, you're likely to get tripped up on what you said. All right, so the decision finally comes. Then what? Well, obviously, and we have a slide on this, obviously the first thing to do is to tell your client about what the outcome is. Uh, send them the decision um, and do it quickly. Don't wait. Don't spend the weekend pondering. You know, clients want to know when there's been a development and an appeal because they have to wait so long from when the, the, from the early stages to the end. And so anytime you have the opportunity to communi communicate a development to a client in an appeal, it's a good idea to do that. And an announcement of the decision is, is one of the prime times to do that. Uh, so just tell them, you know, pick up the phone, tell them this is the basic outcome. I'll, I'm sending you a copy of the opinion. If you communicate with your clients by email and have the, abil the ability to, to send the client a copy by email, do that. Fax if that's what's available. Mail if that's what's available. Um, whatever the, is the most expedient way that you're comfortable with. And then next, I would recommend that you prepare a letter uh, analyzing the decision and explaining what the options are from that point forward. You don't necessarily have to, to pick the opinion apart issue by issue. Particularly you know, if you've got a sophisticated client such as an in-house lawyer, they can read it. Uh, if you've got an unsophisticated, unsophisticated client, you want to explain it in terms that, that are understandable to them. And then the, the, another factor in that is you know, what the client's tolerance level is for you spending you know, three hours picking through the appellate court's opinion and, and summarizing it bit by bit. Uh, that's going to involve a fair amount of judgment on your part. But regardless, I think it's advisable to put in writing uh, some analysis, your analysis of the decision, and explaining you know, where, where do you go from here. Because especially if you're in an, an intermediate court of appeals, uh, there are going to be options going forward. We're going to have things like, you know, do you file a motion for a hearing, which is what we're going to get into next week or, or next session. Uh, what about taking the case up to the next higher court? Those are things that, um, you know, th those are a little beyond the scope of what we're here to talk about today, but we will get into that next time uh, in more detail as far as what those options are. And um, for purposes of, of today's lecture, I would just say spend some time engaging in that analysis, knowing what the client's options are and advising the client what the options are when that decision comes down. So that brings us to the end of the substance of today's lecture. Um, as always, if you have questions, stop by, uh, give me a call during office hours on Fridays. I would invite you, uh, if you've watched these lectures and if you've had questions that have come along, I would invite you to uh, participate in the official study group. Send me your questions and I will, I will make every effort to address them as part of another course another video. Um, for example, we have some discussion going on in the, uh, in the study group about marketing and that's a, the topic of the very last lecture. So we'll be getting to that uh, in, within the next couple of months and I'll be addressing marketing questions specifically uh, in addition to how to market an appellate practice. So again, next time uh, what we'll be doing is we'll have class number seven which will be our next to last class. The topic of that class will be what happens after you get the decision. Uh, rehearing and higher court review as possibilities. And I look forward to seeing you next time then at Solar Practice University. Thanks for watching.